Okay, this next speaker I have introduced so many times, I've honestly run out of things to say. Good things, nice things, bad things, funny things. So, ladies and gentlemen, PZ Myers Beard. Okay, can you hear me? Somebody said no. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to be here again for my seventh year. Whoa. You may notice from my title that after seven years, I'm getting kind of lazy and jaded because I set the bar pretty low this time, right? <laughs> Yes, you can know more than a creationist. Okay, we could just stop here, right? Because you already, you know. And here I am standing in the way of the prom. Okay, well, let's, 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 I'll put a little more effort into it than that. I'll, I'll exert myself and we'll say a little more. First thing, though, I have to mention is uh, I have to say goodbye to uh, Victor Stenger. Um, Stenger was a good guy. Uh, I ran into him many times on the Atheist Conference circuit. We had a great many conversations. Uh, Vic was the kind of guy who, if you've read his, his books, you already know this, who had a deep appreciation for not just the physics that he knew so well, but also the history and philosophy of science. And that's a wonderful combination. I really appreciated that. I just want to tell you right now, if you run into an atheist or a scientist who dismisses philosophy or the humanities, screw them, okay? <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. And Vic was not that kind of, of scientist. So I, I'm really going to miss his contributions here. Uh, you can still read his books, though. He's got quite a legacy. I really recommend God and the Atom as an excellent introduction to the history and philosophy of physics. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I said I'm going to educate you more than a creationist, which you'll see is, is fairly easy, but they don't make it easy. First thing I want to show you is this. Oh, look at that mess. This is the number one paper I get people sending me email about. They write to me and they say, did you see this? It's all this molecular biology and genetics, and it's in a creationist journal, and I can't see what's wrong with it. It sure looks like it's a credible story. They're punching holes in this particular explanation. And I open up the paper and look at it and just laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> it's pathetic. And it makes me really aware that there's, there is a problem here in that there is a kind of specialized knowledge that scientists have that you, many of you at least, blamelessly do not have. And one of the things creationists do that I think is truly despicable is they exploit the loopholes in everyone's knowledge. That what they try to do is sneak things past you with a lot of sciencey gobbledygook, and they really disrespect you when they pull this kind of crap. Okay, so anyway, here's this is just one section of the paper. Not, and maybe you can't, it's a wall of text. I know it's it's tough to read, but basically it's talking about this one phenomenon. And yeah, they're using all the sciencey language. They used a genome viewer software package. They did this search. They analyzed for particular sequences. They found numbers. Ooh, numbers. <laughs> Must be science. Anyway, this is just a small portion. of The whole paper is written uh, in very much in the style of the kinds of science papers I read every day, but it's published in a creationist journal. And it's promoted to lay people all the time. And that's one of the pernicious things about it is it looks really technical, and it's not. It's really a bunch of garbage. So what I want to do today is I'm going to lead you through the, some of the bits of this paper and explain to you exactly why it's a load of bullshit. 
Okay, so what are they looking at? Well, they're looking at a very simple issue, one that's been resolved in molecular biology and genetics for a long, long time, and that is this one. What this is, is an illustration of the full chromosome set from four different great apes. Uh, humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. They're all aligned, they're all nicely aligned. Uh, one of the funny things is that humans have a total of 46 or 23 pairs of chromosomes. All the other apes have 48 chromosomes or 24 pairs. And that baffles some people. How could that be? If we evolved from apes, how come we, did we lose a chromosome? What happened? Uh, no, what happened is that there was a chromosome fusion. If you, it's, I know it's tiny, it's hard to see, and I'll show you a simpler diagram in a moment. If you look at chromosome two, what you find is that for chromosome two, we have one pair of chromosomes, whereas chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans all have two pairs of chromosomes. And so we think what happened early in human history is that there was a fusion of two primate chromosomes to make one human chromosome. And there's a lot of reasons to think that. Among the reasons to think that is the presence of certain structures inside of chromosome two that suggest it was the product of a fusion. And so here, here's that simpler diagram to make this clear. So in the ancestor of all humans, there were two chromosomes called 2A and 2B, and chromosomes have some characteristic structures. For instance, in the middle, usually somewhere near the middle, they have a structure called the centromere. It's a bunch of repetitive DNA that's used as a kind of handle during mitosis and meiosis to tow chromosomes around. And the ends are capped with a repetitive sequence called a telomere. So you can recognize telomeres. Telomeres are really easy to spot. There are thousands of repetitions of the very same sequence over and over again. So they're easy to see. Now, if there was a fusion in our ancestry, as shown here, what you'd expect is that in the middle of chromosome two, you ought to find the vestiges of the telomeres, not at the ends, but in the middle of the chromosome, right? Make sense? And you might, be, if you're astute, you might look at that and you'd say, but you'd also expect to find two centromeres, right? Unfortunately, centromeres do not have as clear-cut and simple and repetitive a sequence as telomeres, so they're much, much harder to spot. So we've been looking for the relics of the telomeres as evidence of a fusion event inside of human chromosome two. Okay, isn't that simple? Now the thing is, it's been found. Molecular biologists sequenced human chromosome two. They looked in there and there's a region that contains the repetitive telomere sequence. We're done, right? No, we're not. This is what the paper I just told you about is about. They're criticizing this argument. They're saying, no, it's not really there. They're trying to wave their hands a lot and use a lot of sciencey language and tell you that, no, there's no evidence of this fusion. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to answer three questions for you. So the first question is, where is that fusion telomere? Can we find it? Is it really there? And that's what the paper is talking about. Then I'm going to answer another question that the creation is kind of strangely ignored. You know, you're looking for the fusion in the middle, right? What about the rest of the chromosome? Isn't the rest of the chromosome kind of indicative of a fusion as well? And I'll show you that evidence that it really is too. And then the third question is, all right, let's pretend there was a fusion in some distant human ancestor. So he had 46 chromosomes instead of 48. Doesn't that mean that individual would not be able to mate with any of his other fellow apes, so he'd die out? And no, it doesn't mean that, and I'll explain that too. Okay, so first question, where is that fusion tel telomere? Here's an illustration of the structure of a chromosome, and as I said earlier, at the very ends of the chromosome, there's this repetitive sequence called the telomere sequence, and it's present as a cap on the ends of all of these. It's got a very characteristic structure. Uh, here's what it looks like. 
So what happens is at the end of your chromosomes, it actually folds around, kind of like a paper clip, and cross-links to itself, putting a kind of cap there. And when you look within that DNA, what you find is the same sequence repeated thousands of times, and that's the sequence there. It's that six nucleotide sequence, T-T-A-G-G-G. That's what it says over and over again, T-T-A-G-G-G, 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 or if you read it the other way, C-C-C-T-A-A, C-C-E-C-T-A-A. You get it, right? It's really a boring sequence, but it's distinctive. When you see that six nucleotide sequence, every molecular biologist in the world says, ah, telomere, easy to spot. Okay. Now, when scientists went looking for it, they found it in the middle of chromosome two. It wasn't thousands, it was dozens. It was because you gotta imagine this is a result of a fusion event, kind of a collision between two chromosomes with a lot of fragmentation there. So you lost a lot of it. Also, this fusion event occurred roughly six million years ago. So there's been some decay. It's not a functional sequence, so it's been gradually eroding over years. But they have found it there. Daniel Fairbanks, as mentioned here, found it, a, a stretch of the center of chromosome two that has 158 of those TTGAA repeats. So it's been spotted, it's been seen. What this is, is a quote from Casey Luskin. And anyone who reads my blog knows how much I love Casey Luskin. Okay. What this is, is, is they made this statement that the evidence for the chromosomal fusion isn't nearly as clear-cut as evolutionists like Kenneth Miller like to claim. Okay. Telomeric DNA at the ends of our chromosomes is normally thousands of repeats of TTAGGG, but the alleged fusion point in humans contains far less it's only got 158 repeats and only 44 are perfect copies, he says. Now, you might be asking yourself, if you're used to thinking quantitatively, is that significant? Does it make a difference? How often do we find these things? Uh, are these kinds of repeated telomere repeats scattered all over the place? And that's what this paper, this creationist paper was trying to do. So let me return to that dense page I showed you up there, and I'll tell you the key things to look for here. So what they're saying is they looked at chromosome two, which is about 237 million bases. It's a huge pile of DNA. And they used a computer to scan it and ask, where are the TTA GGG motifs? Do we find these anywhere else? And they report, yes, we do that what you found is small, isolated, they even call them dense clusters in at least five internal locations, et cetera. Uh, and when they analyze it, what they found is 45,450 copies of TTA GGG and 45,770 copies of CCC TAA. Ooh, that sounds like it's just everywhere. It's just common that there's nothing special about the telomere sequence. And then they also say there's at least 547,300 internal bases on chromosome two composed of widely distributed intact telomere motifs. Widely distributed intact telomere motifs. What does that mean? That means when you look at, the, at, at chromosome two, you find this six nucleotide sequence scattered all over the place. Lots of places have a little TTA, GGG, scattered around in them. It's fairly common, it says. So it says you've got 547,000 of those. Now, this is, this is where I really started laughing because I looked at those numbers and just off the top of, top of my head, I could tell there was something funny going on here uh, that this is kind of weird because apparently creationists don't know anything about probability. This is no surprise to any of you, right? Yeah. So they're asking, where's the fusion telomere? They look and they find this particular sequence. And I knew right off the top of my head exactly how often you ought to see that sequence. If we assume that the chromosome is just purely random junk, and most of it is, okay, if it's just a random assortment 
of nucleotides, what's the probability of any specific six base sequence in occurring somewhere at a particular point in that DNA? It's one in 4,096. So you ought to expect to find TTA, GGG, every 4,400 bases. So it should come up fairly frequently as widely scattered random bits of DNA. Now, I thought, okay, we got 237 million bases. If one in 4,096 will have TTA, GGG, how many of those should we see? Well, we, should, we can figure that out easily. Uh, we expect to see 57,861. How many did the creationists observe? 45,450. Close enough, right? That's ballpark. A few tens of thousands of copies. This is exactly what we would predict and expect from the structure of the chromosome. This is not a surprise. Okay. Also, we expect the number of TTA, GGG sequences to roughly equal the number of CCC, TAA sequences or complements, right? So they should all, they should have equal numbers. And that means that the total number of sequences we ought to find in the chromosome is the sum of those two numbers. So 45,450 plus 45,770 multiplied by six because it's six nucleotide base, six nucleotides in the sequence, and we get an answer of 547,320, which if we go back to here, that's exactly the number they said they saw, which is trivial. Of course, that's what you expect. If you see this many copies of this particular sequence, that's how many internal bases are composed of that motif. But they've got everybody fooled. They think this is something significant. Uh, so anyway, they're making this probability argument, all right? Now, they didn't do the other calculation. Okay, the significant calculation to do is, remember the scientists reported they found 158 repeats of that TTA GGG, right? So what you should be asking is, what is the probability that purely by chance you would have 158 specific nucleotide sequences, six nucleotide sequences, lined up one after the other. Again, creationists love to abuse probability. They're always telling me how improbable it is that a protein would form, right? So this is a calculation they ought to have done, uh, but they didn't publish it because the answer is this. This is the probability of getting that. That's point zero 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 zero. I won't read it all. That's 570 zeros followed by 176. That's the probability of that particular sequence appearing by chance in the interior of chromosome two. So isn't that really silly? I mean, yeah, this, they've, they've found it. It's a low probability occurrence that you would have that many repeats. And what they do observe about the frequency of scattered copies of the six nucleotide sequence are exactly what you'd expect from probability and chance. Okay, so that's the first big flaw. It's not the biggest flaw in the paper, however. <laughs> the biggest flaw in the paper is this one. So I said there's another question. What about the rest of the chromosome? So here you got this 237 million bases, and they are looking at this little spot of 158 bases and saying, oh, that's just not, that's not really a telomere. Okay, what about the other 237 million bases? Maybe it would be worthwhile to look at those and see if they're indic indicative of a fusion event. Okay, in order to explain this, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have to give you a brief introduction to a nice genetics term called synteny. Okay, what is synteny? Synteny refers to the relationship of genes on a chromosome. And all it means is on same band. So in this little diagram over here, uh, A and B are syntenic because they're on the same chromosome, right? And C and D are syntenic because they're on the same chromosome. But A is not syntenic with C. Got it? It's a really simple concept. 
Uh, Sinteni is a lovely word that means on same band, as it says here, and I like it because it's a three-syllable word that means exactly the th same as three one-syllable words. <laughs> the symmetry is beautiful, and it just tells us something about how scientists think. Okay, so yes, we'll just call this Sinteni, and nobody will know what we're talking about. Okay, so here we got syntenic genes. We can map them to their locations. Now let's talk about comparing different species. This is where this concept becomes interesting. Just saying that two genes are located in the same chromosome in a human is, it's information. It's not particularly interesting information. We can use it in some ways, but it's not real exciting. What's fun is when you say, okay, well, what if we look at another species? Can we see how their genes are arranged on their chromosomes? So here, for example, let's say we've got species X and species Y. So these are two different related species. And we look in their genes and we, f and we find that on chromosome 1 in species X, there's gene A and gene B. They're syntenic. On chromosome 2, there's gene C and D. They're syntenic. But when we look in species Y, we find that on chromosome 1, there's A, C, and B, and D is on chromosome 2. OK, so we've got the same genes, but they seem to be shuffled around in a different order. This happens fairly often. It's, be, it's so common that scientists have developed a particular common way of representing it that I'll show you now of showing this relationship between two species. So the, the key is that what you do is you take one of those species and you color their chromosomes, right? Okay, we'll say that species, on species X, we'll color chromosome one red. On species, on the chromosome two, we'll color it blue. It's like paint by number, you'll see. And then what we say is, okay, now what we'll do is we'll look in species Y, and everywhere on the chromosome that has the same sequence as chromosome 1, we paint it red. Everywhere on any of the chromosomes that has the same sequence as chromosome 2, we paint it blue. And so we get something like this. And it becomes instantly obvious what happened in the history of this chromosome, right? You can just look at that and you can say, Oh, I know what happened. There was a little shift. It juggled C over to chromosome 1. And you're saying, okay, this is, this is a trivial example. This is so obvious. I'll show you some more complicated examples in a moment. So anyway, we can map things out this way. We just do this kind of paint-by-numbers operation on lots of chromosomes, looking at lots of sequences, and we get these spectacularly colored images. And furthermore, what we often do is we take a shortcut. So what's illustrated here is those two species, and we designate one as the reference species. So we say, okay, species X is our reference species. So what we do is we just put a key over there. And what it means is we can just leave off the left half of this diagram. We'll just show you the right half, and you'll be able to see how the relative arrangements of the genes are in the two species. Okay, have I lost anybody? Fairly straightforward, right? Simple, it's fun, it's colorful. You get it published in a journal, it looks spectacular. Okay, so we've done these kinds of, of centenny mapping with lots of species, because it is cool and fun. Uh, so I'll show you uh, chimpanzees right here. So this is a centenny map uh, where they're looking at this, these chromosomes, and then they are coloring them by the chimpanzee chromosome number. So what you can see here is wherever it's brown, for instance, that's chimpanzee chromosome one, and it's colored brown on the human chromosome. What, do you, what should you notice here? If you look at chromosome one in humans, it's all brown. There's some spaces in there, that's, that's centromeric and so forth, it's kind of repetitive and it's hard to measure. But anyway, what you see is almost a perfect one-for-one -one mapping of all the genes found on chromosome one in humans are also found in chromosome one in chimpanzees. Yes, your cousin the chimp, you're really closely related. Those, the structure of the chromosomes is very, very similar. Now this, I, th I think they lost an opportunity here. Uh, in chromosome two, notice it's all green. 
That's because they colored both chromosome 2A and chromosome 2B in uh, chimpanzees green. But what it's showing is that chromosome 2 in humans lines up perfectly with chromosome 2A and 2B in chimpanzees. Not just that little bit in the middle with the fusion telomere, okay? It's all the genes. Every one of the genes lines up very nicely in chromosome 2. That creationist paper didn't bother to mention that. Isn't that odd? I wonder why. Now, this is what chimpanzee and human centenni looks like, okay? And you can see it's kind of boring. We're very, very similar to chimpanzees in our chromosome structure. Uh, here's another example. Uh, so I include the chimp centenni again on the right, but that's mouse centenni. And what you should see now is that there's lots of there's patchwork of colors all over the place. When you compare humans and mice, what you find is lots of, gene, lots of genes have been juggled around to different chromosomes because mice and humans have been separated for roughly 70 million years or more, while chimps and humans have been separated for about 6 million years. So all kinds of random recombinations have occurred and juggled it around. Now, that's an, also an interesting result for evolutionary theory because that's what you'd predict, right? That species that had recently diverged would have less scrambling of the arrangement of their genes than species that had been separated for a long time. And that's what we see in the mouse. And further, you might predict, what if we went to a species that was even more separated from humans? What if, for instance, we looked at a fish? fish in, a modern fish and, and modern humans are separated by about 450 million years of evolutionary distance. So you'd expect even more scrambling, and yes, that's exactly what you get. So this is a centenni map for fugu, uh, 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 the blowfish, which everyone knows because it was in a Simpsons episode. <laughs> anyway, what you should see here is a lot of fine grain separation, that we have roughly the same genes, but they've just been moved around to different chromosomes all over the place, like shuffling a deck of cards. But the same genes are there. And in many places, we can see long stretches where not only are the genes the same, but they're in the same order. So this is kind of cool. This is an important result. Forget the telomere fusion marker. The rest of it tells us that this is the product of two chromosomes sticking together. Uh, that's what it tells us, us rational people, uh, not the Discovery Institute. So this is from uh, David Klinghoffer, who's kind of a mouthpiece at the Discovery Institute. And he's saying the same thing Casey Luskin said before, the evidence from human chromosome two is ambivalent at best, really, okay. And he says, the ambiguity is only really impressive when you consider all the evidence. Okay, you could have just that knocked me over with that one, okay. When you consider all the evidence, when you look at all the genes on the chromosome, it makes it crystal clear that this is the product of a fusion of two chromosomes. There's just no ambiguity at all. That what David Klinghoffer and Gouger and Axe and Luskin are doing is ignoring 99.9% .9 of the evidence to focus on the fact that the telomere fusion region is smaller than an intact one which is no surprise at all. The way I compare this, this is, this is my example of this, that you have an accident, right? Those are two cars. Do you believe me? Okay, they look like two cars. But if the Discovery Institute were there, they'd come along and they'd look at that little piece of debris that I've circled down there. they say, I don't recognize what that chunk is. I don't believe there was an accident here at all. I believe God designed these two vehicles to exist in this state on the roadway. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, th this is the kind of thing where I say, you know, when I read this paper, I laughed because of this kind of obvious ignorance, this kind of diffusion of the evidence into nonsense. Okay, but let me, I said that there were three questions. Let's, let's address the third one. Um, won't fusions mess up the mating? That is, you've got an individual who's now got 46 chromosomes. So let's, let's say it's a, it's a young chimpanzee, 
human ancestral woman, and she's got 46 chromosomes, and all her dates have 48 chromosomes. They go to the prom, they get together afterwards. Won't they be sterile? Won't she die out? So that 46 chromosomes won't get propagated. Uh, and that's, that's what the creationists love to claim. So this is from that same paper uh, by Bergman and Tom Tompkins. And what they say is proper alignment requires a near identical structure of each pair. Chromosome fusion is one major common cause of infertility, which is true. It is a cause of infertility. And if meiosis does occur despite the aberration, the embryo produced from the fertilization of these gametes typically self-aborts. Half-truths throughout here. Yes, if you have a chromosome abnormality, it often makes it more difficult to conceive that during meiosis you can end up with uh, what are called non-disjunctions. You can end up with odd numbers of chromosomes in the daughter cells, for instance. But the thing is, if you've got something like this chromosome 2 fusion, uh, you would have a situation like this, where you, in our ancestral human, it's got one chromosome and it has to pair up nicely with its complementary chromosome, and that just means it will pair up with two chromosomes instead of one. This can induce errors. During meiosis, when you produce gametes, I won't go into the details, but it, a certain fraction of these will be aberrant and they won't produce healthy progeny, but if it works out so that one, one cell inherits chromosome two from the human, and the other cell incorporates the two chromosomes from the chimpanzee, it will be perfectly fertile. It will work just fine, 100% of the time. I love to show this example to refute the simple-minded claims of creationists that, that these could not possibly mate. Uh, this is a result of an analysis of um, a woman and her daughter who came in because they, they had some problems. The daughter in particular had mild mental retardation, but otherwise was fairly normal. Uh, the mother was perfectly normal to all observation. And they looked at their chromosomes and they were blown away because what they discovered is that their chromosomes were really, really weird. It's kind of cool. All right, look at there. Okay, what you see, this, let's just look at C over there, that uh, fluorescence immunocytochemistry stain of the chromosomes. And what you see is, is, for instance, look at chromosome six. Notice how one is much shorter than the other. That's odd. That shouldn't happen. Most of us, if you look at your chromosomes, we have two copies of chromosome six, and they're exactly identical in length. What this is telling you is that chromosome six is broken. Part of it is snapped off. Where did it go? Well, it turns out that that broken part of chromosome six jumped onto chromosome nine. It fused with chromosome nine. You'll also notice that part of chromosome nine, if you look really closely, is missing, and it's jumped over to chromosome 11. It's just, it's just like this great big cluster fuck. Everything's just, <laughs> it, it, it just blew everyone away, because here was, there, there were multiple translocations. This chromosome had just been shattered and then reassembled functionally, but not quite in the same order as it is in ordinary normal humans. Uh, when they map out everything, this is, what they, this is kind of a centenny map of that, showing the arrangements of these broken bits of chromosome. They're just all over the place. It's really impressive. But notice what I said. This is from the daughter the mother had similar rearrangements. The mother is similarly scrambled up. The mother was married to a man who had a perfectly normal genotype. How did they get a daughter if this kind of, of hybridization is impossible? You know, like the creationist said, oh, it would just end in some kind of spontaneous abortion, yet somehow this spontaneous abortion is up and walking around. <laughs> well. Again, I won't get into all the details. Uh, take my genetics course. <laughs> Not only will I explain it to you, I'll give you tests on it. It's great. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, normally chromosome 6 would pair with chromosome 6, chromosome 9 with chromosome 9. It would all be nicely lined up. What do they do in these individuals? 
Well, you got part of chromosome 6 aligning with part of chromosome 6 and part of 9 sticking up here, and they have to contort themselves. And this is just an illustration of how the chromosomes arrange themselves during meiosis to split up between the two daughter cells. And it's awkward, it's clumsy, it's terrible. It's going to be highly inefficient. Uh, it's, I suspect that this woman or her husband had a hard time conceiving because only a small fraction of her eggs would have had a complete arrangement of chromosomes. But it still happens. So it's still, the, the cells try to find their way. It was on Jurassic Park, right? Life will find a way. This is an example. Life will find a way to put it all together. So yeah, it would reduce fertility. It would not stop fertility. And the thing is, once this population gets going, and you've got lots of individuals that carry the fusion of chromosome 2, individuals with fusion of, fusion of chromosome 2 will be able to easily mate with other individuals with fusion, uh, fusions of chromosome 2, and they'll have these fertility dif difficulties with those that don't have the fusion. So it becomes a reproductive isolation mechanism. It may be one of the reasons that humans split off from the chimpanzee ancestry is because of this fusion, it became more difficult to have human-chimp hybrids. <laughs> Exciting, huh? Okay. So let me just summarize it then. So here's, here's the answers to those questions. So where is the fusion tel telomere? It's right where it's expected to be with the right probability. It's an unlikely event that would appear by chance. So strike one for the creationists. Question two, what about the rest of the chromosome, the stuff that they all ignored? They're nearly an identical match between humans and chimpanzees. The only way to explain this is by a fusion of two chromosomes. And won't fusions mess up mating? The answer there is no. Well, they will, partially. You'll have reduced fertility, but it doesn't make hybrids impossible. It just makes them less probable. So basically, everything that was in that paper was a complete lie. Are you surprised? <laughs> OK, do you, do you promise you'll stop writing to me about this paper? <laughs> OK. Well, I think I will stop right there. I think I've, I think I've made you know a little more molecular genetics, right? Yeah. Did we succeed? Okay, good. Okay, and I know it's, it's not a tradition at, at, at uh, Skepticon to answer questions, although lots of people before me violated that. But I will not. I will not answer questions now. But I'm standing in the way of Dinoprom. I will be at Dinoprom. And since I don't dance, I will sit there at a table. And you can bring me things to drink. And I will talk to you. <laughs> See, I know, I know how to do a convention talk. OK, thank you very much. We'll see you shortly at the prom.